This is Miguel Molina, El Gavilan, inviting you to join us on Fridays at 8 p.m. for a truly unique experience in Chicano Radio with La Ondas Radio del Barrio Aslan. Cruise with us starting at 8 p.m. as we bring you Rolita after Rolita, Dedicas, Comentario, Informe, y mucho más on your Chicano Pride Wave, La Ondas Radio del Barrio Slan, 94.1 FM KPFA. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, and 88.1 KFCF in Fresno. The time is 1 o'clock. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. And welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. My name is Michelle Chan Fischel, and today on Terra Verde, we'll be talking about clean cars in California. On the phone with us is Russell Long. He's the executive director of the Blue Water Network, one of the key architects of the groundbreaking Pavley Bill. And also on the line is Chelsea Sexton. She is an electric vehicle specialist, formerly with General Motors. And finally with us in the studio is Jennifer Krill of the Rainforest Action Network, and they're one of the groups that are spearheading the Jumpstart Ford campaign. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we start with you, Russell? Um, I'd love for you to explain for us exactly what the Pavley Bill is and why it's, why it's significant. Well, the Pavley Bill is the first bill in U.S. history to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from passenger vehicles. And what it will do is um, it, it will start in the year 2009, uh, assuming that we get through some of the legal hurdles that uh, the auto industry has now presented to us. And it will begin to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from passenger vehicles through the year 2016, and at that time we will see a 30% reduction on average from the typical new car being built. So it's targeted in a number of different ways. It doesn't actually tell the auto industry how to achieve those targets. It gives them wide, a wide variety of options that they use for doing exactly that. Um, it's the, I'd like to call it the pick-your-poison approach, they can choose to either go with more fuel-efficient vehicles uh, as one option, uh, increasing the mileage for the vehicles, uh, which is something that can be done very cost-effectively. They can also go with alternative fuel-powered vehicles, uh, such as natural gas. They can build more of those. Those have about a 20% reduction in greenhouse gases, or they can go with what's known as plug-in hybrid vehicles, which are vehicles that are hybrids that you plug in in your garage, and those will get up to about a 62% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Or they can use propane, and that's actually become quite big in Europe now. They call it autogas there, and those have significant reductions as well. And then you have several other pollutants, such as the air conditioning systems, which use um, very powerful greenhouse gases, um, HCFCs, that can be replaced with more benign uh, refrigerants, and the catalytic converters themselves, they discharge nitrous oxides. So those can be changed, modified slightly to reduce those emissions. So there's a lot of potential benefits. Uh, the auto industry can pick the direction they want to go in. California isn't forcing any of these directions upon them. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can see reductions that even go beyond the 30% over time. And do we expect any other states to perhaps um, get inspired by Patty and start picking these up? Yes, other states can go and adopt California's regulations. Uh, so we've, we've seen that with other regulations, such as um, earlier vehicle regulations that we'll probably discuss in a few minutes um, with the General Motors specialist. And, and those have been picked up in states like New York and New England, 
uh, and and they've helped on air quality in, in in many different ways in terms of reducing fine particle exhaust and also smog forming emissions. And um, you had mentioned that this bill right now, or this law actually, is under attack. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the auto industry has a long history of opposing any types of new safety or environmental environmental regulations. Uh, including everything from seat belts to airbags to catalytic converters. And often auto industry executives have testified before Congress that those very technologies would bankrupt their industries. And lo and behold, a few years later after it's mandated, they've discovered that the cost of meeting the regulations is a fraction of what they'd anticipated and their profits weren't hurt. In fact, in many cases, their profits went up. Uh, subsequent to the introduction of, of those technologies. So they've sued in, in uh, California courts now to try to prevent California from implementing these regulations, claiming that we're mandating increased fuel mileage efficiency, and that's something that only the federal government has the right to do under what's called the CAFE standards. And, frankly, nothing could be further from the truth because the state hasn't told them they have to increase their fuel mileage. Uh, and so the auto industry is, we think they're kind of grasping at straws on this. Um, and, frankly, we'd like to see them do a 180 on this. It's time for them to recognize that greenhouse emissions are a problem. It's ironic that, on the one hand, they oppose raising the CAFE standards in Congress and even in California, where we have our new greenhouse gas standards, they oppose those uh, by saying it should be the feds that deal with greenhouse gases, not California. Right. Well, we'll come. We'll circle back to this uh, topic towards the end of the program. Right now, I'd love to be able to bring in Chelsea um, into the conversation. Um, Chelsea, you were formerly an EV1 specialist with General Motors, and EV1 was the electric vehicle that General Motors had rolled out actually in the 90s. Um, you know, Russell had just talked about how the auto industry has had a long history of opposing environmental programs. And I wanted you to explain to us what California's zero emissions vehicle program was and why it was scrapped. Uh, okay. <laughs> I can make a sense of that. Strangely enough, uh, GM and a lot of other folks would probably argue that the mandate in California originally came about because of GM and because in 1990 they debuted what was originally called the Impact at the LA Auto Show, which came to be the EV1, and they came out and they showed this wonderful electric car and said, we can build this thing. And essentially the California government turned around and said, fantastic, we're going to mandate that you do. <laughs> and so the, the zero emission vehicle program was created, and it mandated that in 1998, 2% of offered for sale would be zero emission. And essentially the only zero emission technology available at this point is electric. Um, theoretically, fuel cells will also be zero emission, provided they run on hydrogen, but they also have their own issues and are a little bit, you know, kind of a ways off. Um, so 1998 would have been the beginning of the mandate, starting at 2%, and that would have ramped up to 5% in 01 and 10% in 03. And, you know, as has been mentioned, pretty much the quickest way to get the auto manufacturers to fight something is to mandate that it happens. And so they immediately, even though they'd already shown this vehicle and that they could do it, General Motors and some other manufacturers as well kind of came out against it and said, you know, demand drives what we produce, not mandates. And so they successfully got the first couple of, of tiers pushed off. And so the 98 and 01 mandates were pushed off in favor of a mem memorandum of agreement, which basically said that all of the major auto manufacturers would commit to putting a much smaller but a certain number of zero emission vehicles on the road. CARB would commit to providing incentives for the vehicles and everybody would move toward the O3 incentive, which then came to include hybrids. And that, of course, has been pushed off as well, um, especially in the face of particularly motors, but also Chrysler and some other folks getting involved in a lawsuit against the state and even the federal governments on the premise that nobody wants electric vehicles and they're not, not the cheapest and safest options and various different arguments that, you know, CARB just simply shouldn't be mandating that they have to produce these vehicles that no one really wants anyway. And did people really want them? Yes, people really wanted them. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. I think that um, when we were talking before, you had said that you were actually one of the folks working at GM who had to tell people, sorry, no car. 
Yeah, um, it was unfortunate. I mean, there was absolutely interest and demand in the vehicles, and we simply, you know, I didn't have them in the area. You know, I, I, my my area was Los Angeles County, Orange County, Ventura County, a lot of Southern California, and, you know, I definitely could have placed more cars in this area than I had, and I ran out long before the program ended, but essentially the programs ended towards the end of, of 01, you know, some of the the manufacturers ended sooner than that, and there was demand before, and there is demand now, and it's something that, you know, most of the OEMs have been pretty successful in putting out public statements that, you know, yes, we realize our owners are loyal, there just weren't very many of them, and there weren't very many because there weren't very many cars. So, you know, moving forward, it's kind of ironic. As, as hard as the auto manufacturers fought the mandate, and in some ways, produce fewer cars probably because of it had there not been those mandates we probably wouldn't have seen cars at all and so could you find ev1s driving around california today and even small numbers oh maybe one or two literally (laughs) yes literally one or two so um russell i wanted to bring you back in the conversation especially because chelsea described a lawsuit strategy as a way of uh scuttling the zero emission vehicle program this is the same thing right we're seeing with pavley yeah, it's exactly the same thing, and, and in fact, they did settle the lawsuit against California, uh, making modest changes in the regulation. And uh, you know, I would hope that they would come to the table and say, we would like to do something with uh, the Padley legislation and regulation to to, um, to to settle this thing, so that we do have something that can reduce greenhouse gases in California. And you know, maybe they have some modest uh, changes they'd like to see that would make sense. I have no idea. Uh, whether there's that possibility or whether the state uh, or the environmental community would even be interested in that. But nonetheless, I think it makes sense to talk. It always does. And um, I would hope that they would also, um, you know, I, I was just listening to the comments that Chelsea was making about about electric vehicles. I, I would hope that they would consider doing something in, in regards to elect vehicles in the future, too. And I know that uh, Jennifer Krill may want to add something to that. I believe Gavin Newsom is still driving an EV1, isn't he, the mayor of San Francisco? I I don't know if it was an EV1 or if it was a Ford Think. But uh, I know that uh, uh, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District is still driving an EV1. So that may be... The one out of the one or two that are yeah, driving around the could be. I, yeah. I, re- I remember Mayor Newsom told me once that uh, I, I had a meeting with him about a year and a half, two years ago, I think it was, and he, he was late for it. He apologized when he got there by saying that he'd, sp- he'd spilled his coffee on the car and it wouldn't start again. <laughs> it shorted out all the wiring. Hmm. So I know he was driving one for a while. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Chelsea, we're going to go ahead and, and let you go. We want, really want to thank you for joining us on the show. Sure. Um, Chelsea Sexton is an electric vehicle specialist. She was formerly with General Motors. Thanks for joining us on Terra Verde. Absolutely. Thank you. This is Michelle Chan Fischel. You're tuned to Terra Verde. We are a weekly environmental video show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFC in Fres- KFCF in Fresno. And you are listening to Russell Long of Blue Water Network. Chelsea Sexton was just with us. She was formerly with General Motors. And Jennifer Krill is with the in- Rainforest Action Network, and she's with us in the studio. Jennifer, I wanted to bring you in on the conversation, especially because you are working right now with Ford in trying to save some of its last electric vehicles. Isn't that right? Yes, that's right. Um, you know, where to pick up the story where Chelsea left off in um, 2002-2003, after um, almost 12, 13 years of lobbying and, and eventually suing the state of California to unmake the zero emission vehicle mandate, um, the automakers won. They, the, the litigation and the lobbying succeeded. At the same time, some of the automakers had been actually working to engineer cars and put cars on the road that would meet the mandate and that was the what gave rise to GM's EV1 program Ford had two vehicles a a Think which was a a small two-seater urban car and then they also had an electric version of its Ford Ranger which we estimate there were about 1500 of those Honda had an EV Nissan had an EV and um, once that mandate went away in 2003, 
um, it, it was a, literally a matter of months, and in some cases it was even before the mandate went away, that the automakers decided to cancel their zero emission electric vehicle programs. Now, today, when you read Ford's website in particular and some of the other automakers, um, you you read about how environmentally minded, and, and Ford came out with an ad a couple of years ago where they said, global warming, there, we said it. Um, you know, these guys do a very good job of marketing themselves as being environmentally friendly. Now, here's what we think an environmentally friendly automaker would do. You would not need a mandate in order to manufacture zero emission vehicles. First of all, um, when the mandate goes away, you would continue voluntarily to, to increase production of the zero emission vehicles rather than take them away. Secondly, when uh, California imposes regulations on greenhouse gas emissions in, in, the, Pavley, in the form of the Pavley Bill, um, you know, what I would like Ford to do, what its environmental rhetoric implies that Ford would do, is it would say, oh, you know, it, it, maybe it is a burden to produce two kinds of cars with two kinds of emission technology in North America. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to meet the Pavley regulation throughout all of our North American operations. But Ford didn't say that. What Ford went for is the lowest common denominator rather than the most environmentally um, friendly opportunity. What Ford is doing right now with the last line of its um, electric vehicles, which is the Ranger electric trucks, um, there's about 100 of them left. Ford has already taken away 1,000 and crushed them. They didn't just kill the program. They don't want there to be any memory of this being a successful technology. And uh, even smugly, Ford offered to its uh, Ranger drivers the opportunity for them to consider the Escape hybrid vehicle um, as, an, as an alternative, which is an SUV that Ford came out with. It's hybrid electric. It still gets 36 miles to a gallon. So it, if, you're, if you're a concerned driver who really doesn't want to use um, fossil fuels, who really doesn't want to have emissions, the Escape is not really the solution you're looking for. Ford, off, in, in Ford made this offer, and then they told these guys, and we're going to take back your zero emission truck, and we're going to destroy it. And um, as I understand now, these people who owned the electric trucks had some kind of lease agreement, and according to the lease, didn't weren't weren't they allowed the option to eventually buy it? Right, um, they were, and then Ford later reneged on that offer. Ford's whole attention to the electric vehicle program, and not just Ford, Toyota, GM, all of these companies, their attention to the electric vehicle program has 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 really been appalling. Um, you know, first they say to the, the drivers, yes, the leaseholders, yes, you're going to have an option to buy your car. Like any of us who lease a car, you usually get an option to buy at the end. Then they sent another letter back that said, no, no, we actually are going to take it back and destroy it. Just on Saturday, um, t you know, uh, six days ago, five days ago, Ford told, told the L.A. Times that um, the reason why the Rangers need to be taken off the road is because they don't meet safety standards. Well, that's patently false. It's a mistake. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, Ford continues to make these mistakes with these vehicles. Eventually, um, the L.A. Times printed um, uh, the, the truth about what why Ford was taking them off the road, which the safety standard had to do with Ford's other car, the Think car. It had nothing to do with the Ranger electric truck. And, you know, it's I, I, frankly, I'm a bit embarrassed for Ford with their missteps over this program right now. Um, what we're asking Ford to do is quite simple. Take the existing Ranger Tide, uh, trucks that are out there offer the leaseholders a title for them, not just the two that are currently engaged in the car sit, but all of the existing Ranger trucks. Secondly, um, open a, reopen its zero emission vehicle program, reopen its electric vehicle program. And thirdly, let's take a look at Ford's overall fuel efficiency. Ford is the worst in America today. For five years running, Ford has had the worst fuel efficiency. We want Ford to dramatically improve its fuel efficiency to 50 miles per gallon by 2010 and eventually produce not just a few hundred, but a fleet of zero emission vehicles by 2020. And I know this is one of the asks of the Jumpstart Ford Coalition, which Rainforest Action Network is part of, as well as Blue Water. Um, I wanted to uh, turn it back to you, Russell, and uh, ask you if you wanted to add anything with respect to, you know, why Ford was chosen as the target and uh, and expand a little bit on the demand set. Well, you know, Bill Ford has just been, has really spoken out of both sides of his mouth on the issue of the environment. And to some degree, 
it's understandable because he's been facing some very difficult financial times ever since the Firestone tire recall, uh, which happens just when he was taking office as CEO uh, five years ago. But on the other hand, he came out, he made a pledge, which was to increase SUV fuel mileage by 25% by 2005. And he reneged on that pledge in 2003 without so much as lifting the phone to call anyone in the environmental community to have a meeting and to to offer his apologies for, for not being able to achieve those goals. He should have said, we can't do it because of business reasons, but we're willing to continue to try to get to that goal and go beyond that goal, and here's the new timetable I'm putting in place. I would like your blessing on this because I'm very sorry that I wasn't able to achieve what I promised to do. But he didn't pick up the phone. He didn't call a soul. And as a result, we don't have any further commitments from Ford. Uh, he hasn't even come close to achieving the promises that he said he was going to. And not only that, but he has continued to lobby in Congress against raising the nation's fuel mileage averages. Ironically enough, if you go back to 1975, for a 10-year period from 75 to 85, the nation almost doubled its fuel mileage averages, and the reason was because Congress set standards to do exactly that. So when you look at the history, the, the only thing that has ever actually worked in raising fuel mileage has not been consumer demand. Uh, it's not been voluntary pledges by CEOs like Bill Ford. It's been the Congress taking action to raise the standards, and unfortunately, Bill Ford has fallen down in terms of doing it on his own, and he has fought efforts in Congress to do exactly that. Our request, our demand to them has been they need to stop lobbying against fuel mileage increases and support strong actions by Congress to do what we did back in 75, because yeah, so that's very important. Yeah, so there's a public policy um, dimension to your demands as well. Um, I wanted to uh, explore some of the different tactics and strategies that the Jumpstart Ford campaign is enlisting. Now, Jen, you had just mentioned uh, previously that there was some kind of a sit-in. Can you explain it, uh, to us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, you know, it's 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 ironic that that we've had to uh, resort to this kind of tactic. But um, you know, we were working with the, some of the drivers of the Ranger electric vehicles, and um, and they were getting uh, some pretty serious pressure from Ford sales department. And we were trying to tell Ford, hey, you know, the Ranger electric vehicles, you know, they've got the customers who have them are very loyal. They like these trucks. They, you know, that it looks just like a normal Ranger. It hauls just like a normal Ranger. Um, it's just a pickup truck. It's, it's the only difference is that these guys for four years have never had to go to a gas station. They've never had to worry about fuel prices. They don't even have a tailpipe. Um, and so we're working with a, a fellow uh, named Dave Raboy and his wife Heather, and um, and then another truck owner named Bill Kortoff who um, said, you know what, if we don't do something, Ford is going to take these trucks away and crush them. And we said, well, let's do something. We started a car sit. Um, it's been eight days now. We started, um, we're on our eighth day. We started last Friday. We're at downtown Ford in Sacramento on 525 North 16th Street. You can get more information on Jumpstart Ford. Dot com. We've got a blog. If you can't go to Sacramento, you can go to uh, jumpstartford.com and uh, communicate with the people who are doing the car sit right now. Um, so for eight days, we've had two full-on zero-emission vehicle electric pickup trucks parked in front of the downtown Ford dealership. And you know what is there? It, it, we're literally parked in front of two rows, three rows uh Ford Expeditions and Excursions and F one fifties and F two fifties. The dealership is offering offering six thousand dollar rebates. If you drive away an expedition today, the downtown Ford will give you six thousand dollars cash back instantly. We're asking for Ford to uh take the offer of these leaseholders and actually buy the buy out the leases on their trucks. It's it's I, I, the ironies of the situation are 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 pretty incredible. I think that what we would call what we're doing right now, when Russell and I both have talked a little bit about the problems that Ford has had, uh, lowest fuel efficiency, um, breaking promises, not 
being entirely um, honest and truthful with the public when they're talking about the programs lobbying against, um, you know, standards that in- increase fuel efficiency or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You know, the truth is that Ford is a company that has a problem, and I would call that problem oil addiction. One thing that you know you've got an addict, one thing that tells you that you've got an addict is when they're engaged in destructive behavior. And what could be more destructive for an automaker than to crush its cleanest, most fuel efficient, most um, most environmentally friendly, most socially conscious cars? For the problem oil addiction, we're doing an intervention. Mm, good way to put it. Uh, Russell, I wanted to turn back to you and um, give you a chance to re, um, to sort of put Ford in perspective with respect to this Pavley, anti-Pavley lobbying. There is a hearing next week, right? The hearing was just postponed until February 7th uh, in Sacramento at 1.30 in the afternoon, and, and that hearing is going to be on the Pavley regulation uh, or the CARB regulation and I, it's really informational. There's not going to be any type of action taken uh, by the committee. Uh, there's the possibility that some legislator could introduce legislation to try to undermine that law, but we're not anticipating that at this point. We think the auto industry is really just going to fight this in the courts. And one further concern, though, is there's a possibility they might try to introduce um, legislation into the Congress to strip California of its authority to regulate emissions from cars altogether. And that is uh, that would be a very unfortunate thing, and, and we would hope that the governor would stand up and battle with them on that because uh, it would obviously hurt the health of, of millions of Californians if we were to lose something like that. And talk about destructive behavior. I mean... It is the company. If, if if Ford actually joins the auto industry in that, then then uh, right now we already have concerns that Ford is marketing uh, Ford's marketing and uh, advertising campaigns around its new hybrid Escape is what what a lot of environmentalists would call greenwashing. But you know, if 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 Ford continues to engage in efforts to undermine California's greenhouse gas emissions law, then. Um, you know, I mean, talk about destructive behavior. I would say the company's on a rampage. Right. Well, I wanted to make sure that our listeners had a chance to get some information, to get some contact uh, info both on the web and by phone, because we are kind of running out of time. Um, Russell, would you please give out the website and phone number for Blue Water in case people want to reach you? Yes, it's www.bluewaternetwork.org, and we're at 415 544 Oh, 0400. Okay, and that is 415-544-0400. And if you are on the web, you can visit www.bluewaternetwork.org. And Jen, could you give out Rainforest Action Network's contact? Sure. Um, for the Ford campaign, you can reach us as well as Global Exchange, another coalition partner at www.jumpstartford.com. Um, you can call 415-398-4404, and uh, you can join the online community for the EV vigil and support um, Dave, Heather, and Bill in their efforts to save their trucks um, at jumpstartford.com. Go online to the blog, send them some comments. They'd love to have your support. They're sitting out there in the cold, and they'd love to have your support right now. Great, and that's, again, jumpstartford jumpstartford.com and um, 415-398-4404. Jen had mentioned plenty of ways that you could get involved with um, the Jumpstart Ford campaign. Russell, really, really quickly, um, are there any things that you would encourage our listeners to do to help protect the Pavley Law? Letters should be sent to Governor Schwarzenegger encouraging him to fight for California's uh, regulation should the auto industry try to undermine the state's ability to do that. They should be following the news to see if there's any activity on that front. And also our website and our phone number. I, I, I'll give you a better number, too, which is 415-544-0790. Again, that's 415-544-0790. And that is all the time we have for today's show. Thanks so much to Russell, Chelsea, and Jennifer for being on the show and to Erica Bridgman, our engineer. This show and others are available online at kpfa.org for your convenience have a great weekend, everyone.
Aya de Leon at the KPFA 2004 Peace Awards. Mad love to KPFA. And I need to say, the 